So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to be here and very honored, and I thank the invitation uh, to uh, the uh, pro to Professor Paolo Rimualdo um, uh, on behalf of myself and on behalf of the Azores Tourism Observatory. Uh, I would like also to congratulate the organization of this uh, international conference um, and uh, the team of Lab2PT. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, our first keynote speaker today, um, Daniela uh, Jelensic. Did I pronounce right? Okay, more or less. <laughs> uh, Daniela is going to make a presentation today about the, um, how to leave a positive impression of a destination and how to create Meaning, meaningful visits with meaningful experiences that are um, <coughs> crucial to a destination uh, competitiveness. Uh, meaningful experiences uh, unique are unique and memorable experiences um, which um, uh, stimulate all senses and stimulate also the uh, emotional involvement and co-creation by tourists. And Danielle is going to explain us the theoretical form for framework uh, in order to uh, create these uh, unique, memorable, and creative experiences. Uh, Daniela uh, Yalen Tich uh, is a re research advisor at the, Univers at the Institute for Development and International Relations in Zagreb. She holds a PhD in ethnology from the University of Zagreb, and her specific interests are in cultural tourism, uh, culture creative industries, cultural policy, creativity, experience economy, and social innovations. She teaches uh, cultural tourism, economy culture, uh, of culture, culture heritage management, creative industries at the University of Dubrovnik, University of Zagreb, Edward Bernays First College of Communication Management in Zagreb, and at the UNESCO Chair for Cultural Heritage Management and Sustainable Development, Institute for Social and European Studies in Hungary. She's the author of several books, uh, chapters, several um, scientific um, articles pu published in uh, well-known uh, scientific journals. And uh, she uh, also has uh, some uh, published, uh, important published books. Um, and um, she uh, also uh, served as uh, the Council of Europe expert for cultural tourism. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's now give the floor to Daniela. Thank you. learning how to pronounce my last name. So, <laughs> so Paula first, could you repeat after me? It's Jelincic. Excellent, so the workshop is... Uh, okay, <laughs> okay, everybody, Jelincic. Excellent, so we can start, okay. So uh, Carlos did a nice introduction of what I'm going to speak today. Uh, so it would be all about emotions and emotional experiences. We have heard a l well a lot or some of it yesterday. So some people touched on that. I was taking notes and I was impressed that even though some of the presentations did not explicitly mention emotions, I noticed the wording they used. I think uh, Michelle used something like we're passionate about something, we love something, and it's all about emotions when creating um, experiences in creative tourism or in life in general. So um, who am I? As you could have seen, I work with the Institute for Development and International Relations with the um, Department for Culture and Communications. 
You heard uh, what are my specialties. I, uh, therefore, I'm an academic. I also teach at several universities or business schools. I'm someone's wife, I'm someone's mother. But who am I also? I'm a KISS fan. Anyone a KISS fan? Okay, you remember KISS? Okay. So maybe this is not the best photo, but uh, you, could see, you can see that being at a KISS concert is an experience. You see all those people here? It was from the Vienna 2017 May concert. I was there, not in the crowd, because I'm a little bit older now, but I was sitting up there. So this is my family, <laughs> my kids, my husband, this is me, at the concert with my husband and my kids. So you can imagine that the experience for us starts way before the KISS concert. So it's how we organize it. We uh, it starts when we book the tickets and uh, with all the excitement if there will be enough tickets because they are sold out like in a few days normally, especially in Vienna. Uh, it's about uh, putting the makeup on. It lasts for hours, right? And then uh, at the concert itself and uh, all the things around the concert, so it's really an experience. So I will talk today how we can organize it. Um, we talked about yesterday about the meaningful, meaningful visits. So normally, uh, well, it shouldn't be normally, but today, unfortunately, normally, tourism does not always provide meaningful visits. There are tourist crowds, there is the gentrification, the commodification of culture lack of authenticity and stuff like that. So challenge today is how to leave a positive impression of a destination and how to create meaningful visits. I truly believe that the experience economy can have a say in it. Uh, some experiences are just spontaneous. They just happen and we cannot have great impact on it. But what if some destinations don't have something which is really so of the wow effect? So we can create it. And how we can do it, I will try to um, inspire you. So what I'm going to talk today about is the fourth element of the creation of the cultural product. Uh, we all know that we first create the key product, which is the artistic product itself. Then we all create the spin-off products that are an added value to the artistic product. We uh, create the related services, which are also um, important, but not necessarily directly linked to the artistic product itself and we have to create an experience of a product. The experience of a product is uh, the issue which is going to make your attraction uh, something special. Everybody has churches, everybody has uh, castles, museums, or stuff like that. So why would I choose to come to visit your museum, your castle, your church? Why this church in Braga and not something else? It's all about how you create the experience. Hmm? So I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about the experience e economy because I believe everybody knows that. Uh, it's just uh, what I want to mention that it was first coined by Pine and Gilmore, uh, but they're in, in the um, marketing sector. So tourism is really a good soil, I would say, good territory for the experience economy because it by itself offers experiences. Tourists want to see something else which they cannot see uh, while they're home. So selling the experiences offers a psychological satisfaction. So we're not selling products, but a psychological satisfaction. Uh, it's not something new. Uh, if you just uh, turn around and uh, if you, if you try noticing people, people usually watch but they don't see. So if you're present in, in the uh, um, 
moment, you can see that uh, a lot of commercials use the same wording, like the Disneyland, which sells experiences. Heineken does not sell beer, they sell experiences. Where's the Dutch lady here? Yeah, okay. Okay, again about KISS, uh, who knows? Um, KISS, uh, this is Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons is a bass player. Uh, in uh, KISS, uh, he came up with a new product he's selling. So if you pay $50,000 to uh, Gene Simmons, you can have an opportunity to go to a music studio with him and record a song with him. So who is a fan of KISS would probably pay that, right? If you don't have fifty thousand dollars, you can you can pay only two thousand, and he will come to your door. He will ring the bell, and he will bring you a collection of twelve CDs, which were never released before. Hmm? These are like uh, um, studio recordings, right? So he comes up with this new product, which offer experiences. So if anyone, we don't have to be a, a KISS fan, but I, I suppose everybody has a favorite band or something, but can you imagine the thing that the, uh, the fan comes to your door and rings the bell and you have a drink with him or a dinner? It would really be an experience. Uh, this is from Croatia, so uh, you don't probably understand it, but this is uh, what I translated for you. Uh, this is the um, commercial for uh, a car, uh, which says, when you ask for the best driving experiences, right? So we offer experiences. This is uh, T-Mobile, actually in Croatia, T-Com, whatever, and they say, be a part of experience. So notice the wording they're using in commercials. Uh, this was a fair, the gaming fair. Again, the best gaming, sorry, for the yeah, wrong uh, letters. Uh, this is the car rental. We create experiences. This is the Slovenian uh, cave, actually. They also say magnificent experience. Or you, everybody knows Lidl, right? So uh, you know how they have like the American week, the Greek week, or stuff like that. This was the one who said experience the taste of America. Or this one which introduces us to the key point of my presentations, emotions. They say, can you sell, sense my smell? Smells stirs emotions. They help us remembering special moments for a long time. Or uh, Irvin Penn, who is a great photo photographer, says that a good photo is the one that communicates a fact, touches your heart, and makes the observer a different person. So it somehow makes you different and possibly transforms you. So in order to be able to explain what, how experiences are created, as a researcher I had, well I'm an ethnologist, a cultural anthropologist, okay? But I had to enter neuroscientific research to be able to, be able to understand it. So what is this? This is how our brain looks like. These are neurons, right? So neurons are connected in the networks. Our whole body is connected with neurons. So for example, if I want to r uh, raise this mobile phone, uh, the process of creation starts with a thought. <coughs> I think that I want to raise um, uh, a mobile phone. So uh, the neuron here, let's say it's neuron age 255, sends a message to another neuron that goes through my uh, hand to my arm and I can raise um, uh, the mobile phone. So this is the normal process of creation. Everything starts with a thought, so be careful what you think, okay? Yeah, it can materialize. When does it materialize, what you think? Only when thoughts and emotions are connected. So when I thought, uh, the thought, <laughs> please raise, your, raise the mobile phone, it was a neutral 
uh, thought, nothing special. What is interesting with neurons is that they are uh, connected by the so-called neurotransmitters. They are connected w uh, in the networks. And simply put, they can be called chemical mailmen. What it means, that they produce moods. They send, a they, they raise um, a, a hormonal um, reaction like adrenal adrenaline, serotonin, or dopamine. So what they send only is not just a thought, but they can also send um, uh, these uh, um, chemistry and uh, they produce moods. Of course, your thought has to be emotionally uh, charged then. So everybody knows how it's to be in love, right? So when you see someone and you really like it, uh, it starts uh, um, producing certain horm hormones and what you feel is the heartbeat, mm -hmm. you, sorry, you uh, blush or something else. Even with the so-called negative emotions, although there are no negative emotions, all emotion, emotions are good, but you know what I think. So uh, chemistry of the brain we create on a daily basis by way of thoughts determines how we feel. So when we talk about it, it's about individual creation, right? Within ourselves. But uh, what we are talking here in creative tourism is we want to create an experience for other people. Hmm? So as to create a pleasant experience, we have to stimulate positive thoughts in our visitor. That's um, the starting point. So a tourism product is what you buy, but a tourism experience is what you remember. This is where we start from. So just uh, shortly, this, the theory says, uh, Pine and Gilmore, that there are four E's so, um, to say, uh, although the last one is not an E, uh, but they did it for the marketing purposes, it had to be AE, right? Entertainment, educational and events, escapist experiences, you probably know their model, uh, which they say uh, they go from passive participation to active participation and from absorption to immersion. Obviously, active particip participation is something which we would like to achieve uh, more than the passive one, and immersion is where you're fully immer immersed uh, in comparison with absorption. So for example, entertainment experience would be like watching a movie. Uh, quite passive, absorptive, but not really something which uh, stimulates you to do something. Uh, the stimulation would come with the educational activity, for example, the clay workshop where you do something actively. If you visit an art gallery, it would be an aesthetic experience, but quite passive one, right? You are fully immersed, you can enjoy it, but uh, it's quite passive. So the highest level would be the escapist experience, which we'll try to do with uh, the experience economy. Like, for example, participating in a theater play where you are all um, in the hands-on experience, right? So we talked about participation, participation and connection yesterday, and we have to understand visitors' aspirations in order to offer memorable experiences. Pine and Gilmer say that there are five main design principles, uh, experience design principles, like attributing a theme to each experience, like Michelle yesterday presented her um, um, website, which is organized around the theme of wines, right? So we all create theming uh, practically every day. Uh, when you are um, inviting, uh, friends to come over for a dinner, you can organize uh, a themed dinner. Probably you will not offer uh, fish for uh, the first course and meat for the second course, but you will organize it around the fish. Right? Or for example, in Amsterdam, I know there is the avocado restaurant. So they serve everything around avocado, from the first uh, course to the dessert. Of course, they offer different foods, but avocado is always the main ingredient. 
uh, harmonizing impressions with positive cues, so we have to give our um, tourists something uh, positive to remember, eliminating negative ones, for example, uh, if it's raining, it's not necessarily a negative cue, but you can turn it into a positive one. Okay, uh, let, let me give you an example. You've all been to McDonald's and um, you know that their garbage cans say thank you, right? What does it actually mean? They put the stuff in here. Put the stuff in here, okay. But it actually says there is no catering service, so you have to do it yourself, right? So this is the example how you uh, harmonize, uh, how you turn the negative cue into a positive one. So these are small things with which you can turn. Not everything will be perfect in the destination, definitely, but try to turn it in a positive one. Then they say what's very interesting and important is to supply memorabilia such as souvenirs to extend uh, the experience. And the last one I would like to focus to, um, the best is engaging all five senses in experience creation. We have heard yesterday the north um, a part of Portugal uh, turned five destinations into five senses. You remember? Right? Which is very good. So uh, psychologists today don't know how many emotions exist. They are innumerable. Right? But they would pretty much agree that the basic emotions are joy, sadness, fear, anger, disgust, and surprise. Uh, when you create experiences, um, you cannot probably think of an array of uh, um, emotions and, and to create your programs around them. But you can start with the basic ones. So I will try to show you by visual stimuli, how you can create some of these emotions. So this is joy. That's probably joy, right? You all smiled. And this one, sadness, okay? Okay, now imagine yourself opening a cutlery drawer, reaching for a spoon or a fork or whatever, and instead of a cold metal object, what you see is Fear, okay? Anger? Have you watched Stranger Things? No? Yeah? No, you didn't? You have to watch that. It's a general culture. <laughs> Disgust, okay? And surprise. So imagine, um, I don't know, biology museum and you can Say, did you know that chewing gum boosts your brain power? So your uh, visitors would probably think, hmm, how come? It's a surprise to me. Do I have to chew gum, you know, in order to be more intelligent or something? No. <laughs> you see? <laughs> okay. Uh, there is one of the psychological theories. It's called the James Lang theories of emotions or jukebox theory which says that uh, the process of creation of emotions go uh, this way. First there is a stimulus, then there is a perception of a stimulus which uh, relates to physical changes and then produces emotions. So for example, if this door would open right now and the lion would show up, how would you feel? What would happen? You would first probably uh, perceive uh, a lion as a danger then I suppose you would uh, feel some physical changes like heart beating and people would start thinking of going out, I don't know, probably would fight or to save yourself, right? So some physical changes would occur and you would feel, you would feel something. Although you may um, categorize this one as a negative emotion, but you would feel. And this is the goal which you would like to create in a creative tourism experience. Not necessarily fear, but let's imagine that you are a museum uh, showing uh, a volcano eruption or uh, an earthquake. So it would actually be a positive emotion if you instilled it in your 
um, visitors, right? Because if they feel the fear for the presentation or the perception of a volcano eruption, then you would be successful in, in your presentation. So what we want to create is not really a reality, but a perception. So is it, is reality re um, a perception? Please, for, you probably know, can, can you dim the, the light? Can you dim the light? Hmm? The lights, just, um, yeah. Focus, please focus for a minute on her nose. Just don't, don't move your eyes, just focus on, your, on her nose. Watching, keep watching to the blank paper, and tell me what you see. <laughs> what happened? She's not the negative anymore, right? Okay, let's try another one. Focus on that. <laughs> She's still there. Yeah, it, it, it lasts. Yeah, it lasts for some time. Just don't, don't move your, li your, your eyes. Just you have to focus for a minute. So again. Hmm? What happened? Nothing? For a moment, right? Yeah. Did it work? Yeah. You obviously know that this is not blue, right? This is red. But what happens when you uh, watch at the blank paper, then it turns blue and it goes vice versa. So this is how our brain works. So what we create in experiences, we create a perception. If we go back a little bit with this, no one ran out of the room when you saw it. You were probably not really pleasant about uh, this experience, but you knew that it was a perception of a danger and not the real perception. Hmm? So what we create is actually a perception. You know this, uh, right? So what color is this dress? Who goes for blue and I don't know which color? Can, can you raise your head? Blue, right? Okay, who said as uh, white and gold? Okay, and if I ask Patrick, he would argue, no, it's blue, it's, uh, and now we're going to no, know it's gold and white, right? This uh, was, um, this happened accidentally. I don't know if you know the story, but the lady was uh, buying a, a wedding dress, right? So, pretty much the same, what do you see here? What do you see? Come on, people. It's participatory experience. You see probably, what color is this? Dark gray, this is white. So put your finger right here in front of your eyes to cover this line. And tell me what you see. Anyone? Gray. It's all gray, right? It all becomes gray. Hmm? Can you see it? Okay, so how come the dress, this, or uh, uh, what was the, yeah, how come we, we trick our brain? It's not because the dress is this or that color, but we create a perception by using the surrounding lights. So what happened by accident here with the dress, sorry, sorry, 
with the dress here is that it was taken accidentally against a certain, I don't know, lux, I, I am not an expert in, in lighting, uh, that the, the lights actually um, influenced the dress and it became different. Uh, it can be done, al done also uh, by using sounds, but I will not use it now. So this was the example of using visual stimuli which can um, change your perception. Uh, we can do it also by, t by touch. Please take your left um, hand and do this. Close your eyes and put it on your nose and move it left, right, left, right. Close your eyes and tell me what you feel. How do you feel that? Can you describe? Hmm? Anyone? Do you have a feeling that you have two noses? Try again. Yes? Okay. So we can play with our brains to create a perception. Hmm? So how to create a tourism experience? It should be authentic. <laughs> Funny, right? Anyone listening to me? <laughs> okay. It should be authentic. It should be local. It should be interactive. It should be visitor center. It should be unique. It should be best in class. And the best things are in details. Please remember that. It's so important not to create the whole product, but how you will, um, um, what, what will your light switch look like? Or uh, how will you decorate your toilets or whatever? This is what makes an experience. So we sell the trip and not the destination. And the experience starts uh, way earlier than uh, when we arrive to the destination. For example, room 121 can be a stairway to heaven and it will be named that way. Uh, and uh, the room 123 will be the room of organ music, for example, right? So that you relate it to some Braga experiences or whichever your destination is. So let me show you how we can use sounds in creating an experience by way of hearing again. Um, you, can, you can leave the lights. Uh, you, you can, sorry, dim the lights again. So uh, uh, the use of music is very effective in creating experiences and studies have shown that income can be increased by 15% if using music. It should always be harmonized with your product and we should create atmosphere and increase the experiences of what the visitors are doing. So try to correlate what you're presenting and how you are presenting it. The first impression matters a lot. Does it transport your visitor to another place, to another time? Does it relax? Does it energize? Does it inspire? Of course, uh, if you are in uh, a spa in a wellness center, you will not use the energetic music. You will probably uh, use the re relaxing music. So what we do actually, we do it in intuitively. But what I'm trying to show you is how our brain function functions and uh, can it really be measured. Um, it's very handy to set the bait. For example, a part of the song which makes your visitors dance or playing the air guitar or whatever, you know, so the use of special rhythms hmm, is um, handy. Uh, can uh, uh, your audience immerse in music? Contrast, for example. Uh, surprise after surprise stirs emotional reaction, but the contrast breaks the story. If you need to make a surprise or something, right? Uh, surprise increases the heartbeat. Uh, empty spaces, the silence is very, very powerful. They use it in films, for example, right? In, in thrillers or um, um, yeah, thrillers or uh, the possible tricks include moving the sound around the space or using the low frequency sounds which are hard to be heard. So let's hear. I don't know how to get here. Can you help me? How to move the the yeah. cursor? Oh, okay. Can you? Okay, so 
I don't want to hurt any anyone complain about oh it's raining you know you can do a lot of programs like dance programs <laughs> yeah but I don't know if it's the case in Portugal but in Croatia uh, all the hotels complain oh it's raining again we don't know what to do with the, our tourists but organize a dance class right um, sadness Everybody knows about blues. So anyone musician here? Yeah. So if you want to create sadness, you would probably, um, well, maybe you could tell us, actually. Uh, you would use uh, minor keys, right? If you want to create joy, you would uh, uh, use the regular rhythm, something which, uh, OK. Fear. good for making movies, right? I don't mean to scare you. But, yeah. Or anger. This one's from Hulk. So maybe we could understand people who love heavy metal. They were probably angry in their childhood or something, right? So this is how they release the anger, by playing heavy metal music. By the way, this was my husband. <laughs> Disgust. You know the sound of, yeah? Okay. I cannot show you surprise because it's not uh, loud enough. Anyways. How can we create taste in creating an experience? Hmm? There are four basic tastes. It's bitter, sweet, salty, and sour. And in the Eastern tradition, uh, there is like the fifth taste, they call it umami, which would correspond to something like a savory taste. So normally when you create, we, we have heard a lot of presentations yesterday about gastronomy in the parallel sessions, and I was really surprised <coughs> positively with, with those uh, uh, presentations. So, but normally what's in the focus is uh, what's between the fork and the knife. But it's not the only important thing. So the environment counts a lot. Yesterday we had a beautiful dinner and it was beautifully served, colorful. So the choice of wine is very um, uh, important. Uh, how you present the food, what's the atmosphere? So the usual criteria you would have to look at is how the food, what the food looks like, uh, what's the form of the food, what's the color. About the color, for example, um, you can probably intuitively get, uh, guess which colors uh, create positive experiences and which don't. Can you? That's just orange. a matter of logic. Orange. Okay, orange. So uh, the so-called warm colors, like orange, like red, is, I did an experiment um, serving the, uh, the eggs, like the half of the eggs which were, uh, part of them were yellow and part of them were green. And when you have them, people will eat the green eggs, but uh, you will see that the plate with uh, yellow um, eggs are gone and the greens are there. Concern concerning the color, what's really interesting is um, the nature itself knew how to do it. So f on an, an example of the strawberry, the strawberry when it's green, uh, it has the same amount of sugar as when it's red, right? In terms of uh, its nutritional value. But you eat it only when it's red because you have this experience, you have the feel that it's ripe, it's good for you. So the, the nature actually warns you 
that the green color is something which you don't probably eat because uh, it's probably not ready for cons consumption, right? So the taste, of course, this matters. The consistency, hmm? uh, the texture, the surface, even the chewing sounds matter. Hmm? The smell, of course, taste is very much connected with smell. The processing technique and, of course, the stories, the history about the food. This is what matters. So just a few examples of the presentation of colors hmm, that they use. Anyone hungry? Possible tricks that you can use while creating uh, experiences based on food as um, to do uh, a gastronomical event on a hidden location. So it gives you an excitement about it, where will we go, what will we do, what the food will be like. Or to use a symbolic space. For example, if you do your event, do it on the street food. Or uh, you use the beach to serve seafood menu. There was a guy in Croatia, actually, he was a restaurant owner, who came up with the idea, a simple, not costly idea, just to put the table, the dining table, in the sea. So when you uh, were dining, you were sitting in the sea <coughs> and uh, your, your legs were actually immersed in the water. You know? And there were like uh, reservations for one dinner from uh, cities which were like 300 kilometers far from this place just for one night. So it's a simple trick, use the symbolic space. You can create VIP experiences like an individual tour with a sommelier or a chef, which we heard about yesterday. Of course, interactions with, with chef, with winemakers uh, count. You can do the hybrid events. Do not use only gastronomy, but you can serve food, like Portuguese food, for example, uh, combining it with a Portuguese film and Portuguese music in order to create an experience. Or you can um, use surprise. Like anyone heard about beer yoga? Yeah, okay, good, you do it? Okay. Um, but the beer came after the game. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Okay, but it's definitely a surprise factor. No one no one would expect yeah. Yeah, it was in it, it was done in a brewery in Kamloops, a, a local brewery, and that was the deal. That was the deal. Everybody was coming to have a beer Excellent. Thank you for supporting my arguments. So smell. Smell is the most memorable sense. Uh, if you haven't smelled uh, cookies of your childhood 20 years after when you smell them, you will remember the smell. Smell is directly linked to the part of the brain which is responsible for memory and emotions and it's directly linked to the taste. You all know when you are sick and you can smell the food, the food doesn't have taste, right? Hmm? It creates the space of identity. You see how important it is? Individuality and separation from hectic life. Um, how do you use uh, sm uh, uh, the sense of uh, smell? Uh, normally in stores they use the so-called cold um, air diffusion technologies. When you know, when you go to buy shoes and um, Shoebox store, for example, you will always uh, sense the vanilla taste or the vanilla smell. Uh, this is what the research say that it increases the stay in the store and um, increases the possibility for a customer to buy shoes. So can you remember this situation, morning coffee? Hmm? So it gives you the sense of smell. Using the visuals also, it gives you the sense of smell of coffee. Smell cells. But which one will you choose? It's not an easy decision. So um, some stores like, or some, some companies like uh, Nike or Coca-Cola or uh, big companies use, um, let's say, in-your-face smells, which are like uh, branded smells which you can buy uh, by these um, cold air diffusion technologies. But uh, my advice to small businesses is uh, be distinctive. Use your own one. Uh, usually the smells of food are used. Uh, 
And why is it difficult to choose a smell? Because smells are inherently personal. They can even uh, cause allergic reactions, so you have to be uh, cautious about it. Uh, I will give you just a few examples, but uh, you can find uh, there, there, there's a whole body of research uh, of smells. So cinnamon promotes concentration and focus. Lavender brings peace and calmness. Peppermint boosts energy. Lemon works on positive moods. And the last two ones are to be chosen by uh, men or women, right? Pumpkin and lavender, sexual arousal in men. Cucumber and licorice, sexual arousal in women. And there's even more to it. Anyone know what synesthesia is? Yeah? Not only two, sometimes even more, yeah? From poetry, you probably know that synesthesia is uh, when you use certain wording of, let's say, hearing to cause uh, some other sense, visual or uh, uh, touch or um, whatever else, right? In medicine, synesthesia is perceived uh, as a disorder, actually. I don't agree with that. And I believe all the artists in this room wouldn't agree with that because uh, many artists have it. So what, personally, as a kid, I was totally sure that certain numbers have certain colors. <laughs> I don't know if anyone of you had this uh, uh, sensation, but for me, number one was red, uh, number five was uh, blue, and number four was orange. The others I don't remember. And I would argue that this is the only color that can be assigned to a certain number. There are people who can assign colors with the days of the week or uh, any name beginning with a D um, creates um, the vanilla smell or something like that. I don't know if, if anyone has it, but Ju Billy Joel has it, Lady Gaga has it, Mozart had it hmm? in their certain um, specific way. They say medically that it's a disorder but in creating experiences, it's very, very interesting, and it gives you uh, the possibility to immerse in the project. So uh, I would advise when creating experiences to use as many senses as possible so that you can uh, create the full experience. Um, now, I would need three volunteers. Anyone? We will do an experiment. Come on, people. This is a creative tourism uh, workshop. So we have to be participatory. Anyone? Good. So number three, can you turn off the lights? <laughs> Excellent. Come. <laughs> okay, we have cards of certain objects. This is powdered sugar. Powdered okay. sugar, okay? Powdered okay. sugar. Uh, banana. Banana. And, and uh, baking, baking, powder. baking powder. Okay? okay, baking powder. If you can see, it looks like this. Okay? And uh, the so, other one? Um, hairspray can. Hairspray a socks. A pair of socks and toothbrush. They're not really toothbrushes for washing the bottle. It's not a good thing. Okay, so I would ask uh, the two colleagues to go, to go out just for a few minutes. Yes, you too. Michelle okay. will stay. And now I will ask you uh, to draw from um, a box slide to draw your objects. So try to remember them again, but with your own eyes closed. Okay? Bad memory. You have bad memory? Moment, you 
you have one minute, just a moment. Just a moment. I will put the stopwatch on. No, 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 no. I will tell you because the internet is very slow. I know you're so eager to do it. So we have a contest actually, so you can earn something. So, uh, initializing, got it, okay. Just a moment. So, start. It was 31, right? Okay, thank you. Let's see if you were right. Click the stopwatch and start. Six, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you can. So, banana, one point. Powdered sugar, two points. But this is not a baking powder, powder. This is coffee. Okay, so you have two points. You can have a seat and ask uh, Bernardo. So you can start. Go. Go, go. Okay. So I got 13 seconds. Thank you. 
good argument. But the thing <laughs> is, the more, thank you, thank you. All. Okay, so. So the thing is, uh, the more you, the more senses you use, the greater the greater the possibility to um, you understand, right? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to an end. Uh, in general, when you create an experience, questions which you need to be asked, uh, the questions you need to ask yourselves are, which emotion? you would like your visitors to feel as a result of your tourism product and which emotional mood is optimal for your visitors before they start using your tourism product, which behaviors are expected after your visitors feel that emotion and does your tourism product integrate all those characteristics. So this can help you when creating uh, an experience. So coming to the title of my presentation, um, it's so nice um, to see that in order to create something, you have to feel. All the artists know that. They can create only when they feel something. Most people can create when they feel positive. But also, there is a possibility uh, when you are very angry that you are very apt to create because you want these emotions out of yourself so you have to do something, right? Uh, so in order to create the experience, you have to feel, but then again, when you create for others, you create so that they feel something, right? So I told you who I am and what I'm intending to be or what I'm intending to do. I, am, uh, I applied for an American um, scholarship and I was shortlisted, and in 10 days, so keep my fingers crossed, I have uh, an interview, think of me on the 18th of June. Uh, I applied for a research, which I will do, um, and the research will uh, focus on the five ba six basic emotions and the five senses, and I will try to measure what's going on in the brain of people by EEG and by functional MRI while they are presented with a visual hearing or other uh, stimuli. So in, uh, by the end of 2020, you invite me for another conference <laughs> and I will present the results. So. so this is what I'm going to be and I hope I inspired you. What about you? So what are you going to be? And if this presentation inspired you, please be creative. Thank you. sciences and psychology in the construction of uh, uh, experiences. Uh, we all know that experiences are uh, important for uh, destination competitiveness and they must be co-produced and unique and memorable uh, experiences. Um, I, um, I'm going to open the floor for discussion but before I would like to ask you two questions uh, according to my uh, experience. And the first question is, um, we have spontaneous versus created experiences. Um, that is uh, something I would like to, to talk about a little bit uh, because we all know that experiences have to be created according to um, methodologies, uh, namely ma marketing methodologies, 
Um, I've been teaching how to construct experiences for the past few years in my master's programs using the Canadian um, Signature Experience Connection um, published by the uh, Canadian Tourism Commission. And they have about 16 or 17 steps before you create an experience. Um, and um, my question is, um, at the end, um, when you use all this methodology, uh, when you're telling the stories and when you, um, you know, you're sharing the experiences with the tourists, um, the stories you're telling and the experiences you are delivering, they have to look spontaneous. So, um, this uh, sometimes even uh, I've experienced um, the, um, the, uh, this problem in the Azores where I'm coming from, where people create experiences and tell stories to the tourists which are lies, but the tourists don't care. They just want to be, as you said before, emotionally involved. And they don't care if it is authentic or not. But that brings the problem of authenticity. And that is the point I would like you to um, talk about a little bit. The second uh, question, which I would like to also address. Sorry. Okay. The second question I also would like to address here is um, you have also um, good experiences ver versus um, bad experiences. Uh, some experiences, and you mentioned that you have to transform bad experiences into good experiences, but many people are not interested in doing that. And I'm going to tell you a few examples. Uh, they just want to produce experiences which are memorable and unique and that people can later on remember and uh, doesn't matter if you have a good memory or a bad memory about them. Um, just going to tell you one of my experiences in Kuala Lumpur where I teach. Uh, I went to a, a dark restaurant which is supposed to be a unique um, pleasant experience but it was not pleasant at all. Um, by the end, I was crying with the waiter, the blind waiter, in the dark room in the restaurant. Um, there was some interaction, emotional interaction with the waiter. And then when I came out of the restaurant, the owner came to me and asked me, did you like the food? And I said, I don't care about the food. I care about this negative emotional experience I had here, which I will ne never forget. You also have all these um, tour operators uh, offering very tough and maybe bad experiences because you know that nowadays you, you know uh, you promote uh, war tourism, um, which is a traumatic experience, uh, visiting war zones uh, and, 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 and they, did, they just don't care. People, there are people who uh, want it, who look for it. There is demand over there. Uh, so I would just you uh, like to ask you to comment on that as well. Thank okay. you. You there? Should we go there? if it's authentic, if they feel good about selling such a story. If the locals don't feel like it's good, then don't do it. Uh, another pretty much soft example can be yesterday in the, uh, at the dinner, we had uh, cream caramel, right? 
which uh, in Croatia we have it, we call it uh, rojata or rosata. In um, Portugal it's called, uh, called pudim flana, right? Or stuff like that. So all Mediterranean countries, all Mediterranean countries claim it to be their local speciality and it's authentic, you know? And we really don't know where it stems from. But if local people believe it's theirs, and they feel good about selling it and presenting it and feeling a sense of proud, then why not? So okay, let me just add that um, we even uh, come to the point where we have truly authentic local experiences which are not appealing to tourists. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the problem. We have pretty much the same in Croatia, like for example, Tourists normally like folklore because folklore is something which is different and we have a lot of uh, staged experiences like folkloric dances in Croatia which are not really authentic or which are not. Tourists love it, but I should say they don't buy the CD. It's good when it's presented in a local context, but it's not really you would, some, you would uh, really make a, commercialize it, you would buy a CD and again uh, um, experience it again at, at your home. While Pine and, Gil Pine and Gilmore, if you remember, say that you should sell souvenirs or um, memorabilia to extend the experience. So if such a souvenir does not extend your experience at home, then it's not a good product, hmm? not good enough. Hmm? So it's a lie, as you say. Right, and uh, concerning the second question, good or bad experiences, they just want to be in a memorable one. Is it a negative or a positive one? Uh, I think it's not so important. Of course, we would like our tourists to feel positive about something. I will give you another example from Croatia. I don't know if you heard, it's the only one in the world. We have the Museum of Broken Relationships. Yeah, you heard about it? Okay. It was um, a project of two people who were a couple, and then they broke, uh, and they came up with the idea to make it memorable by uh, making an exhibition, which was a touring exhibition. It went uh, all around the world. And then they founded uh, a museum. Since it's the only attraction in the world, we always, it's, it's in Zagreb, we always consider it, this is something special, a wow factor and stuff like that. So whenever a foreign group comes to my institute, I take them there. Whereas I noticed that they all come out of the museum like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> they feel, no, there's a Slovenian uh, lady who said, um, yeah, we passed through a certain city on our way to Zagreb and now I remember it the guy I loved so much and everybody's down, you know? <laughs> so I, I thought I will not be taking them again to this museum, but in line with my presentation, it actually means that the museum succeeded in presenting the theme, right? Because the theme is the broken relationship. So it's authentic. So there are no good or bad or positive or negative emotions. All emotions are good. They're ours, they're individual. So maybe that Slovenian lady actually felt cleaned or something after that. So she forgot about this love of her life and she uh, finally settled with the current guy he's with, right? <laughs> or some, I cannot say that it was a transformation, the real transformation, one visit cannot uh, make that, but it makes you reflect, it makes you be present in the moment and um, so, as, as I presented before, if it's a fear of a volcano or um, uh, an earthquake, it's a good emotion. Let me just ask you, what do you remember more, the good or the bad experiences? Um, neuroscience says that the bad experiences are remembered the best. Why? That is a question of survival. Mm -hmm. We all like to feel positive about everything, but life goes up and down, up and down. Why does it go like this? Because we, uh, we uh, evolve. If the life was always up, then we wouldn't evolve. We have to have challenges in our lives, like bad challenges, so that we can 
um, enhance ourselves to be better in some things, right? So it's a question of survival. If there was a lion at the door, everybody would feel fear, but we, will, we would probably learn how to defend ourselves, right? Positive emotions, unfortunately, are not remembered for so, such a long time. So that nation should, after a bunch of good experiences, mix boy with one bad experience, so that people can Maybe, remember. maybe. Uh, another example of, <laughs> yeah. Another example, yeah, but, but you, you know, when you have a bad experience, uh, it's a story you continue telling your friends, you know what happened, you know, so you, you actually remember it, yeah. But there was a, a um, very similar to your example, there was an exhibition, The Dialogue in the Dark, I saw in Graz, it was also a touring ex exhibition. It was like uh, the room this big, but completely black, completely dark, so when you enter, it was supposed to raise the awareness how it is to be blind. So when you enter, you get the, the cane, and there is a the handle you, you can touch, and but, but you practically don't know where you are. There are uh, four situations presented. Um, um, crossing the street, uh, the tram ride, uh, the Christmas um, fair, because it was the time of Christmas. And the last one is the living room where you sit with a blind person who is the guy. So I went there when my uh, children were small and uh, crossing the street was really challenging. You know, you hear this uh, sound of um, the traffic lights that you can pass. And uh, I held my daughter uh, in hand and uh, my son was going with my husband. And when you're in the middle of the crossroads, uh, the, sign, the sound stops, and I started panicking. Oh my God, oh my, then okay, 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 uh, this is not the street, this is the museum, you know, so nothing will happen. But this is the perception they create, right? Then there's the tram ride. You enter the tram, everything was fine, no crowds in the tram, you have a seat and everything, but the train breaks, breaks. something is wrong with the train. So we have to go out, and you don't know where the steps are. And, then there's the Christmas market, the positive experience, the smells, the sounds, Christmas song and everything. And then in the end, you sit in a living room with a blind person and he tells you, then the lights come up. And uh, th this is for the first time you see the guide and he tells his own story about how he um, became blind because he wasn't uh, blind uh, from birth and uh, what his daily life looks like. like um, he works, but his boss won't allow him to take the dog with him. So he has to go, you know. Of course, on the um, exit, there is the donation box. So everybody gives money because you would feel really bad not giving. But uh, you have to set your goals. So the goal was to raise the awareness of the blind people. So it's not negative or you may feel concerned or, but your awareness is raised, so it's an actually a positive experience in my view. Uh, in my view, it was not just a positive experience because the waiter was telling how he was, he was thrown out from his family because the family said you have to bring your own light. And the, the Malaysian authorities do not provide any conditions for blind people to work and have a decent life. And also because the waiter was, uh, well, it was also because I was, um, at the end, you, the waiter put all the food in front of me at the, the fourth of the night, and every single of the room was dark. He said, uh, "Four is here tonight," and, uh, and by the end, all my shirt was full of food. <laughs> <laughs> but now you remember it. I remember <laughs> it. That's for sure. Okay, okay so we now open the floor for discussion. Um, It was a question, or I, I didn't. And it's not, it's, it's not the only one. You say you say that negative experiences yeah, are yeah. remembered. Yeah. They're not. They're not. I speak 
No, the thing is, uh, in neuroscientifically, pain cannot be remembered. We know that we gave birth to a child, that it was painful, but fortunately, see how nature is smart, they made us that we cannot remember the pain. You cannot remember the intensity of the pain. You just consciously remember that it was painful, but you cannot reproduce the level of the pain in your brain. You know, understand? Yeah? So otherwise, no one would give uh, birth to another child, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we still have five minutes. I just add? Maybe I put it wrong. Uh, when, I, when I said, if you don't have anything you can create, it didn't really mean you can invent the tradition. But uh, there are tools like strategic planning where you start from first researching what you have, right? Like you did in Yukon, right? Or Sweden. Uh, you, every village has <coughs> something. It may not be a Picasso. You know, but it's something very small, very unique for the place. You first research, you do the SWOT analysis, you do the vision, the priorities, and stuff like that. And then when you uh, search, uh, this is what the cultural anthropologists normally do, but also other uh, um, experts, uh, then you can see what's really authentic and you can create something. Maybe. Uh, people from the Philippines will not come to Portugal for that, but maybe people from Spain will. It's small, it's local, but it's authentic, so I vote for authenticity. Uh, it's, and it's uh, 
only thing that we practice now. I could say which country, but I mustn't mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Um, so this, at some point, becomes overtaken by an awareness that um, people develop that tourists, so a, a something that they can make, make money out of. So starts with the fact that they're a bit mediocre, they can figure out they can figure out what they can By the time this has happened the 50th time, then the tourists start leaving money. They, they think that this is not something that um, they should pay for. They will, they will offer money, or they will, and this, of course, breaks the cycle. Can you comment on this? So then uh, locals uh, become competitive, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I had pretty much the same situation when I was doing my master's study in Croatia. I sent an anonymous um, uh, questionnaire, and, but if they wanted to reply, they, they could. And that there was a guy who called me and said, you know, um, I have apartments and uh, I offer just a mineral water, and I put it in the fridge. And now my neighbor, is so pissed off, sorry, uh, because he would have to ha- put the mineral water in, in the bridge, uh, in the fridge, because it has to be competitive. Um, of course, it's spontaneous. Um, economy is the driver. People, unfortunately, <coughs> um, do things according to economic uh, rules. But uh, there is a possibility to, to educate people. So you should work with locals. I had a number of projects I learned on the basis of uh, mistakes, unfortunately. And uh, if you didn't work with the locals, explaining them what's in it for them, how they should behave, uh, what's authentic, what's normal, what they should do or should offer, uh, then they start doing it themselves. It doesn't have to be necessarily linked to authenticity or some other um, issues, but it's about tourism planning. So if tourism planning is not well set, then these things happen. Yes. Well, we all learn from our own mistakes. It's not that I know everything, <laughs> but... Um, Difficult. Yeah, but you can always create a council, you know, like uh, representatives of them. So you work with them and then they, you know, you count. It's like kilometers long. I don't know. Well, we'll have to be creative since we are on a creative tourism conference and discuss it during coffee, okay? (laughs) Kathleen. um, Thank you very much for your... You're loud enough? Yeah. I've never been known for using my... No, I'm married. Unfortunately, he's too. <laughs> no, I'm um, actually my husband is also a Kiss fan, so we pass this tradition to our kids. And uh, Kiss is not going to play for a long time since they're around 70 years <laughs> old. No, I'm planning to move only for nine months. Uh, but you have to think uh, about me on the 18th of June at 3:15. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Keep your fingers crossed. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. And I hope to see you uh, in these doors. We are hoping to develop a Korea uh, tour through a source tourism project uh, with uh, Nancy and Becker. So you must be welcome to, to, to visit with us. Thank you. And Thank I would you. like to also Pictures, pictures, Photos. picture please, yeah. Okay. <laughs> very good. Yeah, pictures, yeah. Okay. Very good.